I don't know if you believe this or not. When I was growing up, I was, I got into a lot of trouble. And I, I mean, real trouble, not like, he was, you know, I got suspended from school a bunch of different times. I got, I, live, I grew up in Oklahoma, so they, they still had corporal punishment. I got swats, you know, from the teacher and the principal. Paddle was, I don't know why this was scary as a kid, but they had the paddle. I don't know if any of you had a school that had a paddle. You know what I'm talking about, right? And I have no idea why this was scary, but they had drilled holes in it. You know what I mean? And the ru rumor on the street was that it would whistle when it went through the air, so you knew it was coming. You know, that, uh, they had drilled holes. It was a special, like a ping pong paddle, only big and fiberglass. I got that several times. I even got kicked off the bus a couple different times. You know you're bad when you get kicked off the yellow bus, right? And I don't know, maybe that surprises you about me that, uh, you know, I got in trouble a lot. But I'll tell you the truth, I was not a bad kid. <laughs> That's what they all say. <laughs> I wasn't a good kid either, let's just be honest, but I wasn't a bad kid. The, the truth is that what I desperately wanted was acceptance and, uh, and love and, and, and approval. I just didn't want it from adults. I wanted it from my peers. And I was willing to do almost anything to gain my peers' approval, acceptance, and love. Even if it was sitting in band, playing trumpet in the back of the band, and taking a piece of paper and chucking it at the director in the front of the room just to get my friends to laugh. Because it didn't even matter what happened to me. As long as my friends approved or thought it was funny or thought highly of me. Or being sarcastic to a teacher so that they look stupid and I look smart just so my friends would notice. I didn't have anything against these adults in my life. I just wanted my friends' approval more than my teachers and adults. My parents really liked a child like me. I, I was a real blessing to my parents. <laughs> my mom has many times reminded me that as a child she frequently wished upon me that I would have several kids just like me <laughs> as punishment for my sins of my youth. You know, I'm willing to bet that my issues as a kid were, are not that unique. That most people, I mean, really, when you get down to it, most people want to be good. I, and by good, I mean something very particular. I mean they, they want to avoid punishment and earn rewards. Now, as I said, when I was a kid, I got punished a lot but I didn't care about that punishment. The punishment I desperately wanted to avoid was the disapproval of my friends. And the reward I wanted was not my teachers to praise me, I wanted my friends to praise me. And so even though I was in trouble a lot, I was still trying to avoid punishment and earn rewards. My wife, believe it or not, was a really good kid. Those of you that know my wife, she's still good, she's much better than I am. But you know why she was so good? It's the same reason I was bad, because she found that that helped her avoid punishment and earn rewards. She just found a different way to do it than I did, but we were both ultimately aiming for the same thing, the same need was driving it. And I bet most of us in this room, that is the need that drives us in, in many cases. At home, husbands, when you do the dishes, what are you hoping will happen? That your wife will pat you on the head and say, Good job, thank you. What's the point of doing the dishes if my wife doesn't praise me for it? I, I mean, clean dishes, sure, but that's not really the point. <laughs> or at work, which of us does not want our boss to call our name out and say, I just want to give a special thanks to you because you have made a huge difference in this company and the people of this company should thank and Can we all give a hand for you? Man, that feels good. Or, or, or kids, you want the approval of your peers. You want your parents to love and, and cherish you. You want them to accept you. We all are driven by this in almost every area of our life. We want to be praised and avoid bad things. 
And even when people talk about church, I, I think the same thing is true about God. Most people think of God this way too. Uh, I mean, think about how people sometimes talk about church. They say things like, you know, well, I've, I've been a pretty good person. What do they mean by that? They, they mean that they've checked some boxes and they've, they've done okay with God. Or, or when people have been away from church for a while and they say, I need to get back to church and get right with God. Well, they mean something like this, avoiding his condemnation and gaining his approval. Or, or, you know, the way we think about God, maybe you've thought this way, that, that God punishes bad people and rewards good people, right? In, in fact, the way we frequently think about God is like some kind of divine behavioral contract. Do we think of God this way, right? That, I don't know if you ever had a behavior contract. I had many growing up little chart you stick somewhere and good behaviors get you a sticker and bad behaviors might get you a frowny face or nothing and we think of God that way in many cases that that when we do good things we want a sticker the only problem is we've kind of created our own chart and we put our own stickers on it and then Jesus comes along today Jesus comes along today and he messes everything up you see the gospel reading that we read today is kind of a depressing reading I don't know if you noticed that. It's a depressing reading, and it bears down on us. I mean, Jesus starts by saying, you have heard that it was said. And when Jesus says that, what he means is, hey, you guys have heard that, that God has certain expectations, a behavioral contract, and if you just try hard and you, you, know, you do your best, you'll get a sticker. You've heard that. But I tell you, actually, it's not true. And he walks through a series of common moral issues that you have heard it wasn't a big deal to keep, but Jesus is actually, it's much harder to keep than you could ever imagine. I tell you that actually, you know, you thought you were doing pretty good because you haven't murdered anybody. Hey, good job. No killing. That's great. Actually, I tell you that even when you're angry at people unjustly and you harbor resentment, that's just the same kind of sin that God condemns as murder. When when you say, hey, I, I haven't cheated on my wife, good job. Actually, whenever you look at someone with lust and treat them as an object in your head, that's, that's adultery. It's not acted out, but it's still the same sin going on in your heart. Well, Jesus says, don't ever take an oath. You don't own anything. What are you going to swear on? <laughs> you don't even own the hairs in your head. Don't, don't take oaths. Just say yes and no and let it be true. Don't resist evil people. If somebody tries to do something bad to you, don't resist them. Do, love the people that hate you. Now, look, when you hear that list, we start scratching our heads and saying, what? I mean, Jesus, do you hear what you're saying, Jesus? Do, what you're describing, Jesus, is impossible. What you're describing is ridiculously hard. I don't even understand what you're saying. And when we come across this list that Jesus gives this morning in the gospel, you got two choices. And the route most people take is they have to find some way to get rid of what Jesus said. And so we try to find some way to water it down, right? So it's like, well, Jesus said that, but he didn't really mean it literally. You know, he was, he was trying to make a point. The only problem is the text doesn't read like that, does it? Jesus seems pretty sincere when he gives this list. He doesn't seem like he's, you know, just making a point. Seems like he's serious. So if we can't water down the text and get rid of it, then then maybe what we can do is, um, is just feel really bad about it. You know, when I read through the Sermon on the Mount, I get depressed. It weighs on me. Because my behavioral contract with God gets demolished. And this fake righteousness that I've been living with, feeling pretty good about myself, I'm a pretty good person, Jesus just destroys it. And that's why I hate that list in the Sermon on the Mount. It weighs on me. And just in case you missed it, Jesus ends with one last bit of encouragement. We didn't read this verse today. You'll hear it next week as Jesus goes on in chapter 5. But just in case you missed it, Jesus ends with this last word of encouragement. Be perfect like God. What? How can I do that, Jesus? How can I be perfect like God is perfect? I... I can't even go from breakfast to lunch being perfect, let alone a day or my whole life. What am I supposed to do with this? Then all those stickers on the fridge, they end up on the floor. I'm not doing what God wants, and I can't do it. It's kind of depressing. But, 
But I wonder if part of the reason it's so depressing is because we don't, we don't really understand what Jesus is saying. In fact, we've gotten confused about our relationship with God. And I want to pose to you a question this morning that, that perhaps we have been trying to use God's commands for the wrong reason, and that's why we get so confused and so frustrated. And in fact, I want to say something that's going to sound wrong at first, but I want you to bear with me for a little bit. Maybe Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, maybe Jesus isn't telling us to be good. Maybe that's not what he's trying to say. We hear it that way, do these things and you'll be good. But maybe that's not what Jesus is saying. We hear the Sermon on the Mount and we think, okay, this is what we have to do to avoid punishment and earn rewards. But what if that's not what Jesus is doing at all? What if Jesus has something completely different in mind? Let me give you an example. Uh, I have three kids. Most of you know who my kids are. Uh, they're, they're honestly, they're pretty good kids. They're much different than I ever was. Praise the Lord. My mom's curse did not come true. But in my household, we have, a, we have expectations, jobs that people are expected to do, right? You probably had the same thing when you were growing up or, or with your kids, if, you, if you've had kids. You know, we've got to get the dishes done, and I want you to keep your room clean, and there's a bedtime, and, uh, you know, you need to get your homework done. I mean, we've got certain things that are just part of living in a family, right? But, you know, the way we read the Sermon on the Mount, it would be as if I said to my kids, hey, here's, here's what it means to live in our family. Uh, you need to do the dishes, and you need to go to bed at a certain time, and you need to be good and obey your mom and I. And, and if you do those things, you know, your mom and I have talked, and we've decided that if you do those things, we will love you. <laughs> now, this is not a freebie. You're going to have to earn it, okay? Uh, no sloppy dishes, no sort of bedtime, no staying up reading after we send you to bed. And you turn a light on and read in your bed or start talking to each other, all bets are off. We don't love you anymore. But if you do what we've asked, we thought this through, we will love you. Not only that, we will call you son and daughter. That's right. I mean, this is a good deal. You be good, and we will love you. That would sound ridiculous. The reason it sounds ridiculous is because that's not how family relationships work. I give my kids a list of, of jobs, of chores, of household household expectations. I give that to them because they're my children, not so they can become my children. Do you see the difference? I, I have expectations of my kids because they're my kids, and because I love them. We live in a family together, and there are certain ways that families behave, but they don't become my children because they do those things. But this is how we frequently think about God. When we read the Sermon on the Mount, that's what we think. God will love us if we do this. God will punish us if we don't. He's going to get us. He's going to kick us out. God will accept us as his children if we obey everything he commands. But is it possible? Is it possible that's not what Jesus is talking about at all? That what Jesus is actually calling us to do is not to be good, but to be faithful. And this is completely different. This is a completely different way of understanding this. You see, when Jesus began this section of the Sermon on the Mount, and again, we didn't, we didn't hear this in the reading this week. We heard it last week. When Jesus started this section, this is what he said in verse 17. He said, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Jesus says, I have come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Is it possible that it's Jesus' job to secure the Father's love for us? Is it possible that Jesus views it as his job to live perfectly the law we don't? Is it possible that Jesus views it as his job to take God's wrath upon himself for the sins that we've committed? That, that it's Jesus' job to do those things so that we would become the children of God. It's not our job to do those things. It's Jesus' job. And when Jesus does that, Something beautiful happens that you got to witness this morning. People become members of God's family, not through their obedience and, and the, the good job they did with their kingdom chores, but because God accepts and loves them because of Jesus who has fulfilled the law and the prophets, not because we did. Now, now think about that for a minute and just walk through that mentally. If it's not our job to obey the law so that God will love us, if it's not our job to take God's wrath, then what is our job? Maybe our job 
is to live as children of the Heavenly Father and to trust Him. To trust my identity in what God has done for me. To, to trust in my Father's goodness and care for me that Jesus has already taken care of and won for me. Is it possible that it's my job to live out my identity as God's kid, as God's child, by doing my chores in the kingdom? And those chores look a lot like things that you already know. When you see somebody hungry, you feed them. When somebody does something evil to you, you forgive them. This is what it means to live in the family of faith. This is what it means to live as children in the household of God. When somebody's in need, you help them out. When, when you want to commit sin and run away from your family and do stupid things, you, you rethink that because that's not who you are anymore. These are the household chores of the kingdom, aren't they? And we don't do them to become a part of the kingdom. We already are a part of the kingdom. And I just wonder if we started thinking differently about these kingdom chores and responsibilities, if it wouldn't just change a whole lot of the way we view God. For instance, I don't know if, even know if I'm allowed to say this in church, but can I suggest to you that you stop trying to be good? Stop trying to earn God's approval through your obedience. Stop trying to avoid God's wrath by being good and stopping evil. But instead, like my children, like, like your children, if you've ever had, had kids, that you recognize that you're already a member of God's family because of what Christ has done. And that God's call for us now is not to be good, but to be filled with faith and to trust our Father and to do the chores he's given us to do. I want to challenge you to think about this this week as you go about your week. What would it be like if instead of trying to be good, you tried to be faithful instead? What if instead of seeing God as the divine rule giver and punishing badness and rewarding goodness, what if instead of viewing God that way, we viewed him as our father who loved and redeemed us and now has sent us out to serve him in his kingdom? What if instead of trying to bribe God with our goodness and, and water down our sins so he won't punish us, what if instead of playing that game, we trusted our Father and just got to work in the chores that he's given us to do? This week, I want you to go out and stop trying to be good. And instead, I want you to go and be faithful. Because you're already part of God's family. You've been baptized, chosen, redeemed, claimed by your father and now he sends you out as a member of his family to do your chores go and be faithful pick up your broom in jesus name amen